are invited to speak on a campus, whether it relates to this issue or some other, that in many cases, people are making very individual judgments based on very specific cases. Uh, and it, the 92nd Street Y did this, as I said, just because he'd be troubled, that's a mistake. If they did it because they worry it might be true, and I want to be very careful here, then I understand that. Uh, finally, I think everybody's entitled to a lawyer, and I left out one thing. Uh, Alan, who's now picked up my word despicable, uh, uh, got very upset because I said it was despicable that he represented the worst president in American history. Right. Uh, I, I actually think of something that, an old line in the law, that everybody's entitled to a lawyer, but they're not entitled to this lawyer. And you make choices. This relates to the Me Too movement. Because I think one of the things that's happened to Professor Dershowitz is because he represented Jeffrey Epstein, and because he got a very good deal for a very bad guy, people assume he must be guilty of this other stuff. I think that's wrong. I think lawyers, when they go to fight for a client, ought to fight, once they choose to represent that client, ought to fight as hard as they can and ought to get as good a deal as they can. But I think that's partly why he's caught up in this. But let me just briefly respond to a very good point. You're entitled to a lawyer, but not me. No, you're entitled to me. Let me tell you why. I taught legal ethics for many, many years at Harvard. I taught 10,000 students that you're entitled to a lawyer. How can I then, without being a hypocrite, say, but you're not entitled to me? My job is to represent the most despised, the most unpopular, the people who have very great difficulty getting a lawyer because I had tenure. I couldn't be fired. I was in the Soviet Union in the 1970s representing Sharansky and Sakharov, all those people, because they couldn't get lawyers in the Soviet Union. And I have to tell you, I'm going to continue to represent the most despised, the most unpopular. And you know what? The second most critical appraisals of me was not the O.J. Simpson case. It was when I represented Bill Clinton. Because a lot of people said, what a disgraceful thing, you representing the most horrible president in terms of his personal life and what he did in the Oval Office. I got such horrible accusations for helping Bill Clinton. So, you know, again, the shoe has to fit comfortably on both feet. I'd like to... I'd like I, to I, go... I've got to say, I would not compare Nathan Sharansky and Donald Trump. Who's making I'd, like to, I'd, like to, I'd like to go to this issue of not guilt by accusation, but something that troubles me, which is guilt by association. Just because you represent the President of the United States should not make you, as it has Professor Dershowitz, persona non grata in certain circles. We all have a right to be heard. We all have a right to be defended in court. We all have a right to associate with the policies of a president who we may find odious. A lot of people had it in for Bill Clinton. A lot of people had it in for Barack Obama. Uh, being on the side of one of those presidents should not have made you a pariah. So for me, the guilt by association is very troubling, and it, it made me think of, uh, of a, a circumstance. Last night we had a professor here, uh, Robert Sapolsky, from um, uh, Stanford University. And uh, Professor Sapolsky studied primates um, in the jungle, and he also studied human behavior. He should have been here tonight. Uh-huh. And, and, um, and let me tell you, uh, he, he studied Republican and Democratic primates. Um, and, and what he found, and what he found was something really fascinating. What he found was that um, even though there is a tendency to uh, consider someone of a different color alien, when that person puts on a baseball cap and you're from LA and it says Los Angeles Dodgers or a baseball cap that says San Francisco, uh, the co skin color goes out the window. And there actually can even be areas, which he described in an episode in World War I, where soldiers got out of the trenches during Christmas Eve and started celebrating together, and they didn't want to go back and fight each other the next day until their commanding officers forced them to go back into battle. So my, 
My analogy is, look, if I'm driving down the road and I see a family or a group of people in a broken down car and the car has a MAGA sign on it, I'm going to stop and help that family. I don't care what the MAGA sign says. And if I see a Bernie Sanders sticker on the car, I'm going to stop and help that family. And, and I think on a level of human compassion, we have to start putting aside this guilt by association tendency that seems so prevalent in our society that we ban people from speaking and we ban people from an opportunity of expressing their opinion. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, I'm the director of something at USC called the Center for the Political Future. My co-director is Mike Murphy, the Republican political consultant with whom I waged many campaigns, not on the same side, but on opposite sides. And we managed to maintain a friendship all through that. We've had speakers on campus as varied as uh, uh, Jeff Pollack, who you just gave an interview to on Breitbart, uh, and Stephanie Cutter, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, well, I guess the okay, rabbi's okay. words, I guess the rabbi's words were not heard. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Mark Short, who is the Chief of Staff for the Vice President of the United States. I had the former President of the National Rifle Association, mm -hmm. and we had a perfectly civil conversation, if I can use the word perfect. I didn't agree with him. A lot of the students didn't agree with him, but nobody said he had no right to speak. Okay, so and I, have, I utterly oppose saying people have no right so to speak. So I have a question. You had all these people, the vice president's person, people who were trying to get Donald Trump elected president. Did you ever call them despicable? The way you said it was despicable for me to represent the president of the United States? No, because... Why do you draw lines between you, calling me despicable because I was a lawyer standing up for the Constitution of the United States, but it's okay to not call despicable people who are actually trying to get Trump elected. You know, I'm not trying to get Trump elected. I'm trying to leave it to everybody to decide who to vote for. I'm trying to defend the constitutional rights of all Americans, and you call that despicable? Uh, that, okay, hey, let's hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, no, wait a minute. That is not a question, it's a speech. It's, it, and let me tell you something. You did not defend the Constitution of the United States. You kicked the Constitution of the United States into the gutter. I feel that very strongly. And that's why I said it was despicable. You did not have to choose to represent this man. He does not come up to the standard of the kind of powerless people you were talking about representing before. I know people here don't disagree with me, or don't agree with me, but I'm not giving an inch on this. Uh, reasonable people, reasonable, please, no shouting out. Reasonable people can agree to disagree and can say that defending an interpretation of impeachment and the Constitution does not necessarily paint you with a uh, red brush of guilt. And I think that's, that's, for me, the distinction that's significant. Here at the theater, uh, when we agreed to have this forum, um, we received a lot of Facebook postings. How dare you have Professor Dershowitz in a debate or in a dialogue or a discussion? How dare you? And you know what's interesting? When we had Rachel Maddow here on her new book, Unchallenged, and when we had Bernie Sanders speaking on his book, Unchallenged, we didn't get those Facebook posts, and we didn't get those negative comments. So I'm deeply troubled that just the idea of having this kind of conversation, heated as it has become, is something that we should not do. That, that to me is not acceptable. You should do it. And you should do it, it was right to do it. When Lisa asked me if I would do this and then you asked me if I would do this, I didn't pause, I said yes, I would do it. And I think that makes sense. I, I thought we had moved on from our earlier discussion about impeachment uh, to, to talking about other issues. So I don't wanna go back over all of this again I think we both had our say. I do think there's an interesting question here which maybe you're gonna ask. We're talking about how everybody should be able to speak in these public forums and on campus. What about the BDS movement? Yes, Let, thank you very much. That's a perfect segue and trans, uh, transition 
Uh, now I know you were why you were a speechwriter. Mm -hmm. So um, let's move on to that subject. Okay. Because the campus is also an issue where freedom of speech is very much under assault. Um, in a lot of forums where we've heard people um, from different political persuasions seek to speak, their voices have been silenced. Um, there is a movement that, as many of us have studied it, has been underway for over a decade called the BDS movement, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, which was a planned, concerted, orchestrated, premeditated movement to isolate Israel. And there have been a lot of people who said, well, you know, I'm not really attacking uh, the Jewish people, I'm just attacking Israel. Well, they forget to mention that happens to be the state of the Jewish people. And, and so they're making a distinction that for a lot of us doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. So what's been your experience, Professor well, Dershowitz, on campus in terms of rising anti-Semitism and the BDS movement. Okay, first of all, the BDS movement is an anti-free speech movement. Let's start with that, it's anti-free speech. How do I know that? When Oxford University invited me, the Oxford Union, the oldest debating society in the world, to debate BDS, they invited the head of the BDS movement, Bargudi. Bargudi said he refuses to debate Dershowitz because Dershowitz is subject to BDS because he's a Jewish Zionist. So to start out with BDS as an anti-speech movement. I support the right of people to advocate BDS. I also support the right of people to advocate not renting houses to black people, Jewish people, women, and gay people. You have a right to advocate that. You have a right to advocate anything. But if you dare not to rent to a black person, as you said, or if you dare not to rent to a gay person, you've committed a crime. So what I do is I oppose the fact that BDS is discriminatory in fact. BDS is not advocacy, it's we will discriminate. We will not buy goods from, we will not have speakers from, we will not allow universities to work together with Israeli universities. It is the act of discrimination, not the advocacy of discrimination, which is problematic and which is why I think the BDS movement itself is anti-civil liberties, anti-free speech, and down bottom anti-Semitic. Now why is it anti-Semitic? Because it only selects one country. There's no such thing as the BDS movement, like the gay movement, or the feminist movement. BDS doesn't apply to China, it doesn't apply to Iran, it doesn't apply to Belarus, it is a tactic directed only against the nation state of the Jewish people, and only against the Jewish residents of Israel. BDS doesn't apply to Arab residents, Muslim residents, Christian residents. It only applies to Jewish residents. And so I am in favor of banning the act of discriminating based on national origin, based on religion, but I am not in favor of banning advocacy of BDS as long as BDS is not actually practiced, as long as discrimination is not actually practiced. I helped the president with the drafting of his recent executive order, which was a great boon to opposing, to making anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on campus akin to anti-feminism, anti-gay, anti all the other bigotries. It includes it within the bigotry. But I insisted that, and I didn't have to fight for this, everybody agreed, that the law should say, the executive order should say, this executive order must be interpreted consistent with existing law, which means the First Amendment. So nothing in the executive order can in any way undercut the First Amendment. So I support the First Amendment. I think the First Amendment comes before anything else, but the First Amendment does not protect actual acts of discrimination, which is what BDS is. Professor Schrum. I was gonna say, I was gonna say I entirely agree with that and surprise all of you. I have, a, I have a couple of other comments about it, and then a question. Uh, first of all, I entirely disagree with BDS. I do not and cannot imagine ever supporting it under any circumstances. I, I, I have been to Israel 40 or 50 times. I am not Jewish. I did Ehud Barak's campaign when he defeated Benjamin Netanyahu, which is probably why I hope Alan fails with Netanyahu. 
Uh, but I don't think what's wrong with BDS is it's just about one country. The movement to boycott South Africa was just about one country. I think BDS is wrong on the merits. It's wrong on the whole notion that somehow or other we're going to dictate the policy of a state like Israel, single them out, make them the bad people. South Africa deserved to be singled out. Israel does not deserve to be singled out. Uh, I think there are harder cases. While I tend to be a free speech absolutist, and I can remember debating with my friend Larry Tribe years ago whether or not the Nazis should be permitted to march in Skokie, and of course that was a public street, I think it becomes a much more complicated question when you get to universities. And uh, I, 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 I don't know the answer fully, but I certainly would not be party to inviting a Nazi to speak at the University of Southern California. I would not be party to inviting a Holocaust denier to speak at the University of Southern California. So I do think we have to draw some lines. Uh, BDS is not in that category. I don't agree with them. I think they're wrong. I think the comment to Professor Dershowitz at Oxford was completely wrong. But I think we, we do have to draw some lines and say there are some people who, whom we do not have to lend a forum to. So you see, I, I, my business is miracles. You see this commonality and agreement here? Miracles do occur well, occasionally. Uh, let, let, let me, oh, let Alan, me break I, up the miracle and Alan, disagree a little bit. I, I have one other question yeah. for you. Yeah. Having worked on that executive order with the president, can you get him to reverse his decision to repeal the executive order banning discrimination against gay people in employment by federal contractors? I think it should be. I think it should be reversed. Absolutely. I think that there should be no toleration for discrimination based on sexual orientation. I'll do anything in my power to avoid to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I want to throw a question back at you. You against uh, BDS. Um, do you think the Democratic Party, particularly with the emergence of the Squad, as having more influence in the Democratic Party, do you think the Democratic Party can today be counted on? as it used to be able to be counted on to fight against um, uh, the BDS. Remember that the, there were votes in the House and votes in the Senate. And the votes in the House, uh, many, many, many Democrats voted in a way that appeared at least to some not to be against BDS. And I think part of it was pushed by the four new members of the squad, all of whom clearly favor BDS. What was the, what was the, uh, what was the legislation? It was legislation, it was, it, 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 it was complicated, so it wasn't a clear vote, but the, 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 it, it was clear that all the pro-Israel people voted one way, and a lot of the non-pro-Israel people voted the other way. It was a kind of referendum on Israel, but let me, let me stick to the squad. What do you think the Democratic attitude, party leadership attitudes should be toward the squad's strong support for BDS? Uh, one, I think the resolution was incredibly complicated, and to use it as a litmus test is a complete mistake. Two, I think the squad represents a, a singularly minority view in the Democratic Party, very narrow view in the Democratic Party. I think Democrats are pro-Israel, will continue to be pro-Israel. Well, you know, guys, Come on. Come on, you're kind of hopeless. We'll continue to stand up for Israel, and much to your regret, the Democratic nominee will probably get 70 to 75 percent of Jewish voters in November. Let, 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 me, let, let uh, me just ask you, could you, could, you support, could you support Bernie Sanders for president? Uh, I, will support, I will support any Democratic nominee, not because I necessarily think they are all great, but because I think Donald Trump is the single worst, most dangerous president in American history. We're back, we're back, we're back again, back around the circle. But let me say this about uh, the squad. Yeah. Um, I was involved in holding a fundraiser for um, a New York Congressman Elliot Engel here in Los Angeles. And um, when um, Elliot Engel, after the anti-Semitic comments of Elon Omar, 
refused to boldly criticize her in front of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, which he chaired, and furthermore refused to kick her off that committee, I called Elliot Engel and I said, um, Elliot, how is it possible that you couldn't find the way to at least stand up and condemn Ilan Omar, who's on your committee? And his answer, sadly, Bob, was very telling. He said, 50% of my constituents are of Puerto Rican origin. And AOC said, if I do that, she will personally come in and campaign for my defeat in my own district. So there's a lot of intimidation going on here. And that goes back to the point I was making about intimidation and uh, guilt by association. It's Isn't it interesting? Challenged anyway, by the way. Yeah, by Engel the way, is now being challenged. Isn't it anyway. interesting that what you've just said basically is that Engel has committed what would be an impeachable offense because he took into account his own political electability and changed a position that would otherwise have been a position against her, but because of his own election, his own electability, he changed his mind. Come I, on, I, you I, know I, that I, every I think public Alan, official I think Alan, does that. Alan's and that's a all bit, I ever said. Alan's a bit monomaniacal here. Uh, what we're talking about in the case of Trump was a Congress appropriated the money, the people at the, at the budget office said you have to give the money, he refused to give the money, he held him up as blackmail against Bunner, Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. That's my view. Now I'd like to stop talking about impeachment. I think it's ridiculous to keep going back to it. And we had nothing from Professor Dershowitz on what he thinks the ultimate political impact of this will be. Look, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez got elected with 10,000 votes. How did she get elected? Joe Crowley, who was the party leader in Queens and who had that district for many years, first got it when it was an Irish Catholic district. The district changed. He took it for granted, he paid no attention, and he lost in a very low turnout primary. I think the press is fascinated with AOC. I think she is a bit player in the Democratic Party. I do not think she will become a major force in the party. She loves standing there with Bernie Sanders. And I think that as we look down the road, all of that is going to dissipate. Democrats, look, Democrats have always been pro-Israel. I know the Republican Jewish coalition is here, but Democrats have been pro-Israel. And it, it was not, for example, Democrats who sold warplanes to Saudi Arabia when they were mortal enemies of Israel. It was the Reagan administration. So let's not partisanize this. Let's, in fact, I think Jews, are, the Jew, Jews in America and Israel are so much better off when they don't become a partisan issue between the two parties. No, I agree with they, that, but I think it's becoming support. a partisan issue because more than the four Democrats are now showing uh, a very different attitude. Liz Warren won't come to APAC. Uh, Bernie Sanders went to England and campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn, who was a virulent anti-Semite. Let me announce here today, I have never ever in my life voted against the Democratic candidate for president. I will not vote for Bernie Sanders, no matter who his opponent is. I could not pull a lever for a man who has supported an anti-Semitic candidate in Britain. He didn't have to go to Britain. He went there, he endorsed him, he campaigned for him, and he has forever lost my support. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people share, a lot of people share that opinion, but let me, let me say this, I'd like to wrap it up with uh, a wonderful quote, and you know this from Jewish tradition, but it's one that I've, that I've heard echoed by many friends of mine who are Catholic priests, it is, common decency precedes the Bible. In Hebrew, it's derech eretz kadma Torah, which means common decency precedes even the Bible, the way we talk to one another, communicate with one another, even when, as in the Talmud, rabbis could violently disagree on points of law. Uh, the actual term common decency stems from the way of the earth. It's the way of the earth for us to be able to communicate with one another, especially when we disagree. And I want to thank both of my guests here tonight. Let's give them a nice warm <coughs> thank you. And please shake Nothing hands. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. We can violently disagree, but I think we have some common respect for each other. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thank you.